This is a review of episodes 86 through 94 of the Chimera Ant arc from the 2011 version of Hunter x Hunter. If you have not seen through episode 94 of the 2011 version of Hunter x Hunter, then you should not watch this video because there will be spoilers in it. There's a lot to discuss in these episodes, and although I was a little confused with the chosen direction that the series went in, I think there was a lot of good content. I was not only surprised that Gon and Killua ended up leaving in the first place, but then even more surprised when they remained on the outside. It's weird to have the protagonists separated from the main plot of the show. But now that the king is born and the queen is dead, that means all the other ants are wandering outside into the real world, which will get our guys back into it, I guess. In relation to the first chunk of episodes I watched of this arc, these were a bit of a letdown, although that's not to say that I didn't like a bunch of individual aspects of it. I just, as a whole, it was weaker than the first bit. First of all, let's talk about Kite. His head was separated from his body, which means he definitely died. Pito seems to be using Nen to reanimate him, although I don't think I have any faith in the notion that he's anything more than a puppet or a zombie. They managed to catch him, I guess, but are so concerned over the state he's currently in that they have to observe Gon and Killua and make sure that they seem prepared to see him like that. Now, everyone in the comments is always going off about how the original version had Kite giving Gon Jing's hunter license in episode one. And the way they did it in this version, the timing of when he gave Gon the hunter's license made it really obvious that he was going to die very soon. But to be fair, it became really obvious that he was going to die once he told Gon to run away if things got too dicey. Kite was a good enough character, but I think Kite as we knew him is pretty much never coming back. I think it's something that Gon will have a very difficult time coming to terms with once he finds out about it. Even if Kite still would have been defeated regardless of whether Gon and Killa were there, Gon is going to feel like it's his fault. Unfortunately for him, maybe it is his fault, along with Killua, who has already come to this conclusion. The only realistic thing they could have done in that situation was run away, which is why it's so odd to me that Killua is getting so much crap for it. If I had to identify a main character for these episodes between Gon and Killua, I would have to say that this time around it was Killua. There was a lot of focus on him and the decisions he made. Gon probably got more screen time and more fights but we got more insight to what Killua was doing and why he was doing those things. If we chronicle Killua's four encounters, we can see how much he changed from running away from Pito to successfully defeating Ramit. Bisky confronted him with some very hard truths about how he's been conditioned to only fight against enemies that he's sure he can win against and to flee from all the rest. And we can see this from Killua, because usually, after some frantic inner monologue, he does end up hiding or fleeing. I think if it was just him, then this technique should work, and is totally a valid method for keeping himself alive. The problem is that he's now working with a partner, Gon, who has not been trained in the same keep-yourself-alive-at-all-costs type of way. I don't think it was right to scold him for running away from Pito. But I think Bisky was right in saying that someday Killua is going to flee from a battle which will result in Gon getting killed because he won't flee. He tried to resist his training, but his failure against Shoot kind of just confirmed Bisky's assessment and reinforced all of his insecurities on the matter. And up until that part, I'm pretty much on board. Killua even said that Gon would be better off without him because he wouldn't go into a situation thinking he had someone to rely on when in fact he didn't. But then Killua was able to step up and help Gon while he couldn't use Nen and protect him from anything, including Ramit. The thing I didn't really get was what he ripped out of his head. Was it some kind of device that Illumi was using to spy on him? Or in a way even kind of control his subconscious? There really was never any explanation for what it was, besides Killua just determining that, oh, Illumi must have put that there and then shrugging it off. 
But I guess now Killua has overcome this handicap and can stand up against other opponents, which means he shouldn't have to leave Gon. And that's good growth for him, but I hope that doesn't mean that we're going to miss out on any paranoid ramblings. Gon's fight with Knuckle was garbage, because literally all of it was just solving an algebra equation. If your technique takes eight minutes of an episode to explain, and the gag is that it's way too confusing to be understood, then it's too elaborate and needs to be made simpler. But like Killua's fight with Shoot, we really didn't get to see any of it past the explanation. This show seems to thrive on the setup to the fights, and then they're like, well, that's done, you can just use your imagination to figure out what happened next, and then they move on and we don't get to see the actual fights. It's kind of the opposite of One Piece, where we get to see eight episodes of a fight, but we'll get zero training episodes, whereas Hunter x Hunter spends all this time on training, and then when the fight finally happens, it's like one episode or less than one episode. Everyone says that I'm wrong for expecting to see fights from this show, but when they spend that much time on the build-up and then give us basically no payoff, it's just kind of a letdown. But I suppose Gon's big character moment was after the fight, when he broke down because he wasn't able to enter the country again to save Kite. Personally, I like it when the show's hero loses or becomes weak because that's when they have to be the most honest about what they really want and what their motivations are. That's when we get to see their insecurities and what's really troubling them. For Killua, it was dealing with the realization that his instincts could get his best friend killed, and Gon had to deal with the fact that just wanting it hard enough wasn't going to be enough to sustain him anymore. Just because he's more passionate about something or thinks he deserves it more doesn't guarantee his victory. And I said this before, that I like the fact that our protagonist is not the strongest in the group. In fact, he's probably among the weakest. If you think about all the characters who have been introduced in the Chimera Ant arc so far, of all the allies, Gon seems like he's the worst fighter. It's a unique perspective that's very rare, and I think that's what sets Hunter x Hunter apart from a lot of other anime. This arc brought us a bunch of new characters, and brought back a bunch of old ones. Bisky came back for some more training, and that was fun, but she wasn't terribly different than how she normally was. Although we did get to see her be a bodybuilder again, so that was amazing. Palm was kind of meh, and I almost feel like I would have been fine without her. All she really did was up the creep factor, not only from her just general presence, but also the blatant pedophilia. Although she does seem to have some kind of ability to see into the unknown, but that guy Nov seems to really have his hooks deep into her. He seems like some kind of tactician who has a weird teleportation-ish type of ability, but we haven't seen much of it yet, though let's assume he's pretty strong. Between him and that guy, Moral, he seems more reserved, although I think his personality is just as abrasive and bitchy. He just does a much better job hiding it. Moral is much more in your face, although you can't really argue with a guy who carries around a giant pipe. Along with Knuckle and Shoot, these are the guys that went into the Chimera Ant area and started taking out large portions of them. With Natero, of course, which is just kind of a good time. But you wanna know the best thing about these guys? They might die, but also they might not. This makes it so suspenseful because I don't know who's gonna make it to the end and who is gonna be killed. The only two characters that I feel like will definitely survive this arc, with no question, are Gon and Killua. And it's a very unique position to find myself in. In addition, Hunter Hunter deaths are frequently not too glorious either, so even if it is a relatively main character, he could still have kind of a terrible death that doesn't have any meaning. So not only do they happen to people that you don't expect to die, but they happen suddenly at very unexpected moments. This is an amazing quality that this show has, and no one can take that away from it. Whether you're a die-hard fan, or you're a die-hard hater. But I guess now we have to talk about those ants a bit. They finally have changed things up now that the king has been born. And so the king is this huge dick who looks so much like Cell from Dragon Ball Z that it's very distracting. Although I'm sure I'm not the only person who's made that comparison. 
He took his three royal guards, and then he went off to find a human slaughtering farm where he can search for the rare humans, the ones that are able to use Ned, because they're the most delicious. He's got Pito, who manages to transform all comments in the comments section about what the gender is. In the manga, it's ambiguous, but in the anime, they made a choice to make Pito female, even though she does tend to use the word Boku, which, yes, tomboys do occasionally use, but it's very rare, really. Not really a rule. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to use she, and if you have a differing opinion and you use he, then that's fine. I don't mind, but that's just what I'm doing. The other two guys have gotten less to do, but they're basically a butterfly and Goliath from Gargoyles, which is a badass show that you should totally watch, and I like really feel like I want to marathon it now. The king himself hasn't really shown me anything unique, because I figured he'd kill the queen and alienate all the other ants. This prompted all of the ants to go out and decide to make their own clans, which actually made them a lot easier to kill, I feel. But what about Colt and that tiny baby he found inside the queen? I honestly don't know where that's headed. It's cool that he's not gonna kill humans, but he's definitely responsible for a lot of people dying. I have to assume that the baby is somehow significant and whatever or whoever it grows up into will be somehow significant in some way. Or it could not be significant at all and just be a plot device through which Colt gets his redemption as he moves away from the Chimera Ant lifestyle. Can we assume at this point that Colt is sort of done with being in this show? I guess it wouldn't bother me too much because he was pretty bland. Now before I wrap things up, I just want to say that I actually really like the way they keep the same opening theme song all throughout, but they just always change the visual sequence. I don't know, I think it's a good way to brand your material by always keeping the same song. But that's all I'm going to talk about for these episodes. Next up, I'm going to be watching 95, 96, and 97 as a triple feature. We're probably going to be seeing Zombie Kite pretty soon, which is not necessarily something I want to do, but it has to happen, so might as well be now. I suspect that's probably one of the reasons why you guys wanted me to watch these episodes. I'll see you next time. Bye! If we chronicalize... Chronicalize? Chronicalize? Chrono... Chronicalize? Chronicle. <laughs> I need to speak English more. Chronicleize. But that's all about. Oh.